<laughs> hey y'all and welcome back to Carbon Scoring, the best place for comics, history, and action figures. Today, we're going to take a look at the Mezco 112 Green Goblin Silver Age action figure. And we're going to do it by looking through the lens of the Green Goblin's comic history, including his role in the breakup of the Stan Lee and Steve Ditko partnership on Amazing Spider-Man. Plus, hang around to the end of the video, where we're going to announce the winner of the giveaway of the Mezco 112 Spider-Man action figure. But before we get to that, you may be wondering, what exactly is the Silver Age of Comics? Why do we call it that? Well, I'm glad you ask, because the Green Goblin plays a critical role in defining comics' Silver Age. Comics as we know them grew out of the hugely popular newspaper strips, like Prince Valiant and Buck Rogers. But the Golden Age of Comics is clearly defined by the coming of Superman in Action Comics number one. Throughout the Golden Age, superheroes dominated, but westerns, romance, and science fiction also flourished. But it was the lavishly illustrated horror comics from EC that almost doomed the industry. The publication of Frederick Wortham's Seduction of the Innocent and the subsequent congressional hearings led to the creation of the Comics Code Authority, severely limiting the type of stories that could be told and essentially ending the golden age of comics. But in 1956, with the publication of Showcase Issue 4, introducing Barry Allen as the Flash, the Silver Age began. Superheroes were back, but it was upstart Marvel Comics, with their relatable characters, bombastic art, and shared continuity of storytelling that defined the Silver Age. While there were several factors that led to the coming of the Bronze Age of Comics, an era known for darker stories and more focus on social issues, there was one definitive event that ended the Silver Age and thus began the Bronze, an era where you were no longer promised a happy ending. That was Amazing Spider-Man issue 121, the night Gwen Stacy died. And whether you blamed Gobby for knocking Gwen off that bridge, or you fought Peter for the jarring snap of her neck when he attempted to save her, one thing's for certain comics would never be the same again. And you can certainly say the Green Goblin was one of the most important characters of comics' Silver Age. Okay, that was pretty intense, but it's vital to understand how important the Goblin is, not just to Spidey's history, but to comics history in general. Now that we've established this as the definitive Silver Age Green Goblin, the box art really represents this. Unlike the box art from our Spider-Man, which featured only art by Steve Ditko, this box actually spans over 20 years of great Green Goblin artists. Now, predominantly, we're looking at John Romita Sr. This comes from issue 39, his very first issue on the title, and this big image actually comes from the splash page of issue 47. But there are a ton of other panels here from great Spidey artists like Ross Andrew and Gil Kane included. So first impressions of the figure itself, and oh man, this thing is super good. Now, it's interesting when you really look at it like this, the Green Goblin's costume is not that complicated. He's got kind of the purple middle part, purple gloves, purple boots, and the mask. But they managed to take this simplicity and bring out a ton of detail in it, specifically the kind of mesh pattern that they have going here simulates that almost chainmail armor look that was drawn in the comics, but because it's like a soft kind of inlay over the top of this, it doesn't get in the way of the articulation. And it's included all the way down the legs as well. It's just a really nice effect. And you can see how it kind of shines in the light and provides just that little bit of extra shadow as you move him around. The gloved hands look really natural. These are plastic, so they're not like the, the leather parts up here. So they don't they don't uh, wrinkle as much. And you do get decent movement at the chest. Uh, again, same thing here. These are plastic at the boots. And one of my complaints with the Spider-Man figure was just not enough ankle rock articulation. It's about the same here. But when I get him up on the glider, you'll see he does manage to get into a pretty decent crouch. Of course, Goblin has to have his Goblin bag. And this one is that same leathery type material as his tunic and if you open it up it actually has an interior space there's a little piece of foam in there so that it maintains its shape i suppose you could take that foam out and attempt to put some of his 
you know, bag of tricks in. I'm not going to. I, I like it as it is because it has just enough heft to it. There's also an underwire in the strap so that you can kind of get it and keep it in positions. So when you're doing photography, it'll actually hold its shape really well. This is the main head sculpt for me. And I love that you can see kind of the three-dimensional aspect of this giant mask that's coming around. I love the curve of it, the, the huge, huge ears, which Ditko started with, but certainly Ramita took from that. But it's the maniacal head sculpt that just makes this figure so awesome. We, we got like five different heads, and we'll take a look at each of them, but this is the one that I'm going to use predominantly. And I think from these images, you can clearly see why. Let's take a look at this figure in comparison to some other Green Goblin figures to see how he stacks up. So here are the two Mezco 112 figures of Spider-Man and the Green Goblin. And I really like the differences in their size. You can see that obviously the Green Goblin is taller, but he's also wider and bulkier. And I think that's a pretty good representation of Spider-Man versus the Green Goblin in the Silver Age. During that time, Spidey would have been in his late teens or in college, whereas Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin, would have been a full-grown adult. And so I like the disparity between their two body types. One thing, though, that I think makes the most sense is these two just look like they belong together. The, the vibrancy of their colors and the way that the cloth costumes fit, these two were clearly a pair. All we need now is for Mezco to release images of that Doc Ock that they've teased, and we could really be rolling with some Silver Age Spidey stuff. Here's Gobby next to the modern age Green Goblin figure. He's maybe just a little bit taller, but obviously the big difference is you can see those muted colors and a little bit more of the metallic tones in the modern versus those bright technicolors of the Silver Age figure. Now we're going to compare him to the Spider-Man Classics figure that's based on the art of Umberto Ramos. Again, look at how different the proportions are and how the manga influences of Ramos' figure with the hands, the feet, and the exaggerated stylings compare to the art that very much represents the 60s and early 70s. A figure that much more closely represents the design aesthetic of the Mezco Goblin is the Goblin from the VHS 2-pack. Now, this one has much more Silver Age Technicolor colors of the costume, and I think the head sculpt of the VHS 2-pack really kind of represents the artwork of Ross Andrew, whereas the Goblin from Mezco hits more of that John Romita look. But I think it's interesting to see these two that really both kind of have that Silver Age vibe going on. Now we have what I have always considered to be the gold standard for the Green Goblin in six-inch form, the early Marvel Legends Goblin from Toy Biz. And when you're looking at these two figures, the green of the Green Goblin is a little bit darker on the Toy Biz figure, but these two have far more in common than they have differences. They have so much similarity in the facial sculpt and the overall vibe from the Goblin. You can clearly see that the Mezco figure is slightly taller than the Toy Biz one. That Toy Biz one has been kind of downscaled, like the scale of Marvel Legends have slowly crept up over the years, and he's a little bit smaller and out of place. But these two are coming in right near the top of my list. And one of the most common questions that I was asked after my review of the Mezco Spider-Man figure was, how does he compare to the 1970s Mego figure? So here we have them. Brothers from another mother, both of our cloth costume goblin figures together. I think that they actually look really cool. I mean, it it's so amazing to see these two right next to each other, to see what almost 50 years of action figure history looks like in one place. I don't have a favorite here because I love that Mego Green Goblin so much, but I think it's worthwhile putting them side by side. As I mentioned, the figure comes with five unique heads, and it almost creates like a case study in mental illness as each one is more maniacal than the last. You begin with the simply smirking goblin, and I love the confidence that this exudes. This, this is a goblin that knows he's stronger and smarter than Spider-Man. But you pop that one off, grab the next one, and you get the, pop it on, you get the grinning goblin. So here you have a powerful but but sort of maniacal goblin who's got a full grin, 
but not quite a level of total and complete insanity. No, that comes with the next head, which is probably my favorite of the masked heads. Pop it on. Yeah, the full crazy goblin. This is the Green Goblin that I know and that I'm afraid of. This is the Green Goblin that knocks Gwen Stacy off the Brooklyn Bridge, just completely out of his mind, engulfed in power and insanity. Now, one of the things I was disappointed about with the Mezco Spider-Man is just how bland this Peter Parker head is. But thankfully, that is not the case with the Goblin, because we got not one, but two Norman Osborn heads. The first one is a very, very stern, angry Norman. You can see his jaw is clenched. Look at how that muscle is tightened right there. And it's different on the other side. You can see he has clenched his jaw on that side and it really comes across. Look at how furrowed down his eyebrows are and how they've sculpted those wrinkles down into his forehead. He does have that unique Norman Osborn hair that he shares with his son Harry that was first drawn by Steve Ditko, but then carried on by every artist from there on. He's an older man. You know, he's a full-grown man, so he does have wrinkles all the way across his brow, and that is clearly evident here. Very much different than the boyish look of Peter Parker. But then we get the absolute crazy Norman. So here's Norman fully cut loose, one eyebrow cocked, the other gleaming with insanity. This is the kind of Norman that's unpredictable, the one that you absolutely do not want to face. Again, here you can see even more of that brow crunched down, but they get the arc of his eyebrow up and that open mouth. So much great paint detail on this. When you're talking about buying a premium figure, these are the kind of alternate head sculpts that I'm looking for. It's not actually an extra head, but the removed mask accessory is just so creepy I had to show it. Liking what you're seeing? Let us know in the comments. And subscribe to Carbon Scoring, because we're bringing you the best in comics history and action figures every week. And if you want early access to these videos, consider a channel membership as well. The Green Goblin's role in the death of Gwen Stacy was not the only era-ending story that he was involved in. It has long been rumored that the debate over the Green Goblin's secret identity was the final straw in the strained relationship between Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. Ditko famously quit Amazing Spider-Man after turning in issue 38, and he did so without saying a word, which was shockingly not unusual. It turns out Ditko and Lee hadn't been speaking for months prior to this, with Ditko turning in completed art and stories for Lee to script. Lee admitted to this setup in a 1966 Time Herald article stating, I don't plot Spider-Man anymore. Ditko thinks he's the genius of the world. We were arguing so much over plot lines, I told him to start making up his own stories. He just drops off the finished pages with notes at the margins, and I fill in the dialogue. Lee claimed that it was a disagreement over the Green Goblin's secret identity that led to Ditko quitting Spider-Man. According to Stan, he wanted the Green Goblin to be somebody that we already knew. Otherwise, he felt like we would be cheating the readers. Stan said Ditko wanted it to be somebody completely random because that would be more like real life. Which, of course, makes no sense because we've already established that Lee and Ditko had not been discussing plot points for months. For his part, Ditko said nothing. For decades. He let his art speak for him. But in 2015, three years before his death, he wrote an op-ed in the Comics Journal where he stated, The only person who had the right to know why I was quitting refused to come out of his office. Stan refused to know why. Plus, the Goblin identity story just doesn't hold water. Ditko had set up Norman Osborn as the Green Goblin from the very beginning. He was quoted in 2009 saying, quote, I knew from day one, from the first Green Goblin story, who the Green Goblin would be. I absolutely knew because I planted him in J. Jonah Jameson's Businessman's Club. It was where J.J. and the Green Goblin could be seen together. I planted them together in other stories where the Green Goblin would not appear in costume. I wanted J.J. and the Green Goblin's lives to mix for later story drama involving more than just the two characters. I even planted the Green Goblin's son with the same distinctive hairstyle in the college issues for more dramatic involvement and storyline consequences. So how could there be any doubt 
dispute about who the Green Goblin had to turn out to be when unmasked. End quote. I'm going to go with Ditko on this one. For his first appearance in issue 14, Ditko said, quote, Stan's synopsis for the Green Goblin had a movie crew finding an Egyptian-like sarcophagus. Inside was an ancient mythological demon, the Green Goblin. On my own, I changed Stan's demon into a human villain, end quote. And while I made the argument in a previous video that Mezco's Spider-Man was the definitive Ditko Spidey action figure, I stand by the fact that Gobby here is much more an amalgam of Silver Age styles. But that doesn't mean there aren't some serious Ditko touches to this figure. We might not have gotten Ditko's flying broomstick design from his very first appearance, but when the Goblin reappeared in issue 17, he was now using his famous Goblin Glider. This Green Goblin figure has no lack of accessories, and none more important than his Goblin Glider. I think in profile, it really makes a great Silver Age glider. There are a ton of little details. I like that he can reach down and grab the handle. It's a little hard to get the figure actually to bend enough to do that, but the handle slides up and down, so you can bring it up a little higher to help him reach it. But if you want it down for the sleeker profile, that works as well. Nice touch to have the control panel here with just a little bit of hint of different color to bring out some of those dials and knobs. The wings are articulated. You can see they're on a piston, piston mechanism here, so you can get you know more bend to them. I tend to usually tend to have them down a little bit farther. Something that is a big bonus is the foot pegs for the figure not only have heel pegs that actually fit really tightly, but then these strap over the feet as well. So when you get your figure on this glider, he's not going anywhere. Now, the glider itself has accessories, such as a very classic looking flame effect coming out of the back. I tend to like mine more simple like this, but you can add these little uh, engines on the bottom, which I think give it a little bit more. They have different size holes so that you don't put them in the wrong way. I think that gives it a little bit more of a modern look. You can kind of see them when they're there. That's one of the reasons why I don't always have them in, but you can easily switch them out and switch in instead these. They have to go on a very specific way. These poured in very easily and give that blast effect but also provide a base. So if you don't want to have it on the flight stand, which is the classic Mezco flight stand, these are really good. I use these all the time for other figures because they're really tight and they hold the figures really well. But if you want him a little bit lower to the ground, this makes for a pretty cool effect also. But clearly the design team at Mezco read issue 17 of The Amazing Spider-Man, which included this panel. Because every trick in the Goblin's bag was included with this figure. There are lots of tricks hidden in the Goblin satchel, beginning with these, uh, I don't think we're really allowed to call them batarangs, but let's just say that they're flying goblins. He has three of those, but he also comes with one that just slots right into his hand that gives it a throwing motion. So that's, that's pretty cool. I don't know if this was done on purpose, but if you look closely at this hand, the thumb on mine is not there. It's like it's been shaved off, and I didn't find it anywhere in the package, but I will say that without it there, it's much easier for him to hold these different utensils. Modern writer and artist seem to have forgotten one of Goblin's most useful features, and that's his Goblin Blast. Here you can see he's got it on this pointed finger, and it's simply an attachment that pops right off. The figure comes with six regular pumpkin bombs, Three that have a smiling pumpkin, and three that have an angry pumpkin. But the ones that I tend to use are this one with the flaming pumpkin, and this one with the smoking pumpkin. They're just that much more dynamic, and they look so good in the goblin's hands. You also get three alternate hands where the goblin is throwing some of his most classic weapons. Here, you can see he's launching a pumpkin bob out of his hand. And this one, it's one of his rarely used ghost bombs. But look at how crazy that ghost face is and how great it is coming right out of his hand like that. And finally, yes, they did it. They gave us the flying frog bomb. 
It made one appearance in only two panels in Amazing Spider-Man 17, but the good folks at Mezco gave us a fully sculpted frog that you can see launching from Gobby's hand. It is this kind of level of detail that separates these Mezco 112 figures from all the rest. So, final thoughts on the Green Goblin. I think this figure is nothing short of excellent. It doesn't represent one singular artist's style the way that the Mezco Spider-Man did. It's much more of an amalgamation of an era. An era that the Green Goblin really helped to define. I think that the, the facial sculpts, both of the Goblin mask and particularly the Norman Osborn heads, are tremendous. And his accessories, particularly this Goblin glider, are really well done. Plus, the leather feel of his satchel it just, it adds a first-class touch. All of the different weapons from the pumpkin bombs to the grenades to the frog are just utterly fantastic. He does have good enough articulation to get into the kind of poses so that you can swoosh your green goblin around the way that you expect to. And he crunches down really well. The sturdiness of his foot pegs and these straps on the glider are an absolute extra bonus. But it really comes down to just that Silver Age maniacal vibe of the Green Goblin, and this one has it in spades. I truly believe that this is a worthy Goblin figure. I'm not sure that he'll replace my Marvel Legends just because some of these Technicolor colors, the brightness of the green and the purple, don't necessarily go with my other Marvel Legends, but if Mezco continues to make more of these Silver Age figures, we could assemble an absolutely spectacular collection of Silver Age Spidey characters. And Mezco's a company where, if they really wanted to, they could make a J. Jonah Jameson. They could make a Mary Jane Watson, a Gwen Stacy, a Betty Brandt, a Ned Leeds, a Robbie Robertson. They could do the people of Spider-Man's world and could do them justice. But hopefully we'll see that Doc Ock that's been teased. And then who knows where we could go from there? The Lizard, Mysterio, so many options, and if they come out as well executed as this Goblin, I am going to be very, very happy. We really focused this video on the Mezco Green Goblin figure, but if you're looking for a comprehensive review of the Green Goblin's comic and action figure history, I got you covered. Just click on this link or search for this video on my channel page. Okay guys, here's the moment that many of you have been waiting for. We are going to announce the winner of the Mezco 112 Spider-Man action figure, which is coming to one lucky viewer absolutely free. So thankfully we got a bunch of you guys that subscribed and hit like and left me a comment. In fact, we had over 800 comments for this video. So let's give the random number generator a shake. 465. All right, let's go to the comments and see who that is. And the winner is... Cowbell TV, who said, I love how you captured some of Ditko's classic pages with the new Mezco figures. Thanks for another great video. Hey, thank you for being a loyal supporter and viewer. And hit me up in the email that I've got listed right here on the screen. It's also in the description. We'll get in contact and I will be sending you that Mezco 112 Spider-Man figure. Want to see more action figure reviews like this? Hit me up in the comments. And as always, for the best in comics history and action figures, subscribe to Carbon Scoring.